So I will start. So good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Billy Fullwood, and I will be the chair for this evening's talk, uh, using plants of local provenance to create wetland habitats in the, lo in the lower Eeyore. So with no delay, it's my great pleasure to introduce Martin Hammond, professional ecologist with the Lower Eeyore Conservation Trust, who will be speaking about using plants of local provenance to create wetland habitats. Joining Martin is Pandora Thorsby and Laurie Reed, both of whom are lead volunteers of the Lower Eeyore Conservation Trust and they will talk about wetland plant propagation methods. Before we begin, I would like to remind the audience that any questions can be popped into the Q&A box during the talk, and I'll read them out during the Q&A session at the end. Also, a recording of this talk will be uploaded to the BSBR YouTube channel tomorrow, so that you can rewatch it at your leisure. So, take it away, Martin. Right, good evening, everybody. Um, I hope this is working. I can just see my screen. Um, uh, let's find the doing slideshow from the beginning. Um, let's try and go back. <laughs> uh, right, good evening. Uh, my, yeah, my name is Martin Hammond. I'm the ecologist for the Lower Ewa Conservation Trust, which is a, a small nature conservation charity um, based um, in the um, uh, Ripon area of, of North Yorkshire. Um, and what we're going to be talking about this evening is uh, five years of experience in um, fen creation on a, a former, well, it's actually a still a, a working sand and gravel quarry um, at Nosterfield, which is between um, Ripon and Massam in North Yorkshire. Just to give you some background, um, our kind of project area is the flat bit in between the um, uh, North York Moors to the east and the Yorkshire Dales to the west. Um, the trust was set up in the late 1990s, um, primarily to promote best practice in the restoration of mineral sites. Um, I believe there's something like 20% of aggregate production, that sand and gravel quarrying, um, is concentrated in the Lower Ewer and Swale Valleys. So there's a lot going on in terms of quarrying um, and the trust wanted to uh, to um, try and, and steer that in a, a coherent direction. Um, uh, it, it has to be said that that aim still still evades us to to some extent. But uh, the um, LUCT has taken on a much wider role in recent years. Um, so it's involved in the management of county wildlife sites, for example, um, lots of other initiatives in the the surrounding landscape. Um, there's an active partnership with English Heritage in uh, managing um, an area of, of an important area of Neolithic monuments nearby. Um, we do lots of work with the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust and work in other local nature reserves. And it's very much a, a volunteer led charity. Um, we do have one full time project officer and I'm there full time, but all the hard work is done by our fantastic volunteers. So our um, geographical focus is on um, this area, really a lowland, predominantly arable landscape. Um, it's <clears throat> uh, the national character area is, is predominantly the Vale of Mowbray, but we do have the Magnesian limestone ridge on the kind of like the, uh, the western flank of our area. So if you imagine, if you, if, you know, many of you will have been to, to Richmond perhaps, um, it's the area from there, um, sort of like down to down to Borough Bridge um, and across to uh, to Masson. This is a pretty depleted um, landscape in terms of in terms of biodiversity. Um, if you go drive through it at the moment, many people do. Um, basically, it flanks the A1 corridor, so predominantly arable, lots of roads, um, a number of military airfields lots of aggregate extraction and so on. So it, it has to be said, it's not the most inspiring of Yorkshire's landscapes, but there are um, remnants of, of high quality habitats, mainly associated with the river corridors, um, small fragments of magnesium limestone grassland, um, and a number of, of small, um, but very interesting remnant fen sites as well. So when we've looked at what the conservation priorities are for the area, it's very much these fens and associated wet grasslands, lowland meadow and magnesium limestone grassland that jump out um, as the, the really special habitats um, of the area. And we've got a number, from a botanical point of view, we do have a surprising number of, of interesting 
plant species. So the remnant wetlands have things like tufted sedge, caratulata, great fen sedge, cladium moriscus. We've lost tufted loose strife, Lysimachia thysiflora, but we are hoping to, uh, to reinstate that. And um, then on the, the limestone grasslands, we've got some interesting plants, including rare spring sedge, it's Carex erigitorum and thistle broom rain. Um, we had, you know, the original intention of the trust, I think, was to try and create this joined up approach to, to mineral sites because there are so many opportunities potentially available. Um, despite the best efforts of LUCT, there's been little political will to do that. So we have a, a long, long way to go there. Um, but what we have been very concerned with is to ensure that habitat creation and habitat restoration is authentic to the local landscape. So we probably sort of differ um, slightly from some conservation organisations in that sense. Um, I think this is quite an important point for me to try and get over because I know that within BSBI and the wider botanical community, there's a wide range of views about introducing native plants to places where they don't occur naturally. Um, and I hope I'm going to give you some reassurance that we've we've tried to, to look at habitat creation um, in a very kind of like focused way. So we see the surviving remnant plant communities of semi-natural habitats as our template, as our model for recreating habitats. Um, so we're... Um, we certainly wouldn't go down the line, for instance, of buying in commercial seed mixtures and so on. We're very interested in in uh, uh, trying to sort of like recreate or, or reconnect um, the existing habitats. And we see habitat creation as a way of, of creating stepping stones that link and defragment those areas that have survived. So, so that's one element of the, the low when we talk about creating wetlands using local plants, that's one element of it. We're interested in, in trying to, to recreate something similar to existing local plant communities. Um, we're also interested in preserving the, the kind of genetic integrity of the, uh, of the local flora. So we're very much focused on using local provenance plants rather than buying them in from the other end of the country. And in order to sort of like get where we've got to, um, we've built up um, quite a, an interesting evidence base. Um, there's four strands to that, environmental archaeology. Um, the area around Nosterville Quarry, our experimental site, um, is nationally important for Neolithic archaeology. There are uh, three um, henges that are major monuments and a lot of other stuff uh, has gone on in that landscape. As a result, there have been lots of paleo-environmental studies done, and these are really interesting because they can tell us you know, what wetlands in the area were like in the early post-glacial period, right through to the uh, to the late medieval, even post-medieval period. We've done a lot of work on landscape history to understand where remnant habitats originate, how they've been influenced by, by land use. Um, and we've done a lot of work on researching the botanical history of the area. So the excerpt here is from um, John Ray's Historia Plantarum, um, published in 1688. Um, this is talking about a record of tufted loose strife by Matthew Dodsworth, who was one of the local vicars. Um, and he used to ride around collecting plant specimens and he contributed to, to many of the, the earliest British floras. As a result of that, we've got a really quite deep archive of botanical records. Um, so since then you had the sort of like the advent of Georgian botany um, and then <clears throat> into the Victorian period and so on. So that provides us with a lot of information about the fine grain of ecological change in the local landscape. Um, and then, as I've mentioned, we're, um, we've kind of catalogued and, and surveyed um, remnant habitats in the, the surrounding landscape. Our trial site um, it covers about a hectare and a half. Um, so it's a working sand and gravel quarry operated by Tarmac in between Ripon and Massam. And uh, for those of you who know your vice counties, it's in BC 65. It's a lowland site, so it's at no great elevation. And this is a, a photograph from 2017, I believe, um, 
work started in earnest in 2018, but um, this area that looks like a beach in front of you is basically the fine sediment that's pumped back from the suction dredging process. So on some sites, um, sand and gravel are quarried dry, so they'll actually lower the water table by pumping. Um, on this site, it's, it's excavated wet uh, from beneath the water level. And the very fine material that has no no use is, is pumped back in, um, so it forms a, a basically a beach on one side of the of the lake. When we started work here, this was very sparsely vegetated with just pioneer vegetation. Um, unfortunately, including New Zealand pygmy weed, Crassula helmsii, which is the the bane of our lives. Um, it has to be said, this is a pretty challenging site. Um, it's not the perfect trial site by any means. Um, the, the water is strongly influenced by the magnesium limestone aquifer. So sometimes the, the water pH can be up to eight. Um, unfortunately, there's also, it's an arable catchment. So groundwater quality isn't fantastic. It's probably fed to class it as moderately eutrophic. Um, as well as the crassula, we also have uh, many things that want to eat our plants, <laughs> including a very large grey lag population and uh, a huge bunny population who are you know, remarkable in their ability to scale enclosures. We, we think they have jetpacks, not quite proven that yet. But um, we've also got wave wash. It's a rather large lake um, and we've had recent problems with sediment deposition. Um, the upside to that is that if things work on this side, site, they're probably going to work on others because we certainly don't have perfect conditions. So when we originally started wetland um, creation, we were looking, we'd always favour natural regeneration. And in some cases, we've had very good results with other, other types of habitat. With damp grassland, for instance, we've got a, a fantastic site that's purely naturally regenerated, has eight species of, of orchids, it has creeping willow, all sorts of things that just amazingly have, have, have blown in. We found with kind of marginal fen communities that this didn't really work. So even on sites that have been left 20 plus years, um, there was very little regeneration of that, those marginal wetland species. Uh, if you excluded grazing, you'd get typha, you'd get jointed rush, you'd get phragmites, um, but you wouldn't get a great deal else. And we also tried some small scale experiments with direct seeding onto prepared ground. Um, and again, they didn't produce, there were a number of species that regenerate okay that way. Meadowsweet does okay, purple moorgrass does okay, not many other things do. Um, so we had to look at actually physically uh, introducing plants to try and uh, start creating wetlands. So as a result of, of that experience, we set up a, a nursery and run entirely by the trust volunteers um, and that's grown from a, a small enclosure to um, a, a commercial sized polytunnel um, and lots of, of outside beds and that's what um, Laurie and Pandora are going to be talking about after I've finished. So we soon found with, with their expertise that we could create um, 20,000 plus plants a year which is, is enough to start habitat creation on a, a meaningful scale. Our initial plots were linear enclosures that we planted at 50 centimetre spacings, um, basically um, using kind of like a, a, a species rich wet reed fen um, as a, a, a kind of a template. Um, and that model has, has worked fairly well. Um, that was just a, a kind of like um, uh, purely an experiment, but it, it, it seems to have, as, as, a, as a, a basic planting plan, that seemed to have worked. Um, and our approach, although we've uh, planted plants along uh, hydrological gradient, our aim has never been to kind of like garden that. Um, anybody can plant plants. The point was to create communities that were going to um, develop their own dynamics and their own characteristics. So if you like, it was a matter of trying to uh, introduce the right ingredients along roughly the right gradient <clears throat> and then watch and see if they... Um, assemble themselves into recognisable plant communities. So it's been a, a proof of concept experiment. Um, there are lots of things that we would have done differently had were we able to um, turn back time, but um, 
it, it's been rather kind of patchy in, in terms of, of the funding that's been available. Um, there's been all sorts of issues with the you know, water levels and things like that. So we haven't been able to do it as coherently and we haven't been able to do the, the design as scientifically as we might have liked to. So, so just, just indulge us um, on, on that, please. But what we do try and do is the results we do have, um, we try and disseminate on the LUCT's website. So it's just luct.org.uk. And there's various information on there. Um, there's also, well, remember that there's, there's uh, links to various reports on our evidence base about the historic landscape and historic botanical records and so on. Uh, so one of the things we tried to do um, in a, a roughly scientific way was look at the survival of individual species. So one of our plots, um, we monitored individual plants over a four year period um, to kind of like check their, their longevity and their survival. Um, we stopped that after four years simply because it became impossible to distinguish the individual plants from um, their, you know, the, the vegetative offspring of them. Um, the results were quite interesting and in some ways they were they were very heartening because they showed that some of our key species, so species that are very characteristic of local wetlands like uh, great fen sedge, cladium, uh, the tufted sedge, carex elata, um, uh, blood-flowered rush, juncus subnodulosus, all those plants did very very well. I'm conscious here that I don't know if it's different for you, but on my screen, you can't actually see the percentage survival because the, the photographs are all over them. I don't know if there's anything we can... Is there a way around that, Billy? Uh, it should be... Uh, people should be, uh, hopefully, able to like, adjust where the, yeah, where the screen is yeah. on, on, on their screens, I think. If, if, if you like take your mouse cursor and like hover it over the thing, you should... Hopefully, have an option to like. Oh, um, I can do that. I can do that. Yeah, can't I? Yeah. Yes, brilliant. Yeah. Um, so you can see that those four species, which are a characteristic of these base-rich fen habitats in the local area, did really, really well. So we actually had a hundred percent survival of cladium, which we we really didn't expect. It's quite a, a rare plant of, of mainly of ancient wetlands. Tufted sedge, you know, we lost a single plant. Um, blood flowered rush did did reasonably well, so so that was a, a good omen. You know, the, the, these these important species, these key species, survived really well. Um, as you might expect, kind of thuggish things like common reed and yellow flag um, also did well, as did the indestructible watermint. Um, a lot of the smaller plants, and particularly the the dicotyledons, um, didn't do so well, and several of them, in fact vanished entirely. Um, this could be for a variety of reasons. Water levels didn't help. Um, you know, perhaps some of the, 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 the plants weren't particularly well developed. Um, I think crassular invasion was certainly one of the, um, the main factors. So we very rapidly found that um, we just had this, this carpet of crassular throughout the entire site. And there's, you know, there's very little you can do about it in practice. It also, traps a lot of debris so these plants that retreat below ground in winter um they just don't have the energy to or, you know to push back through this very competitive blanket of crassula so our wet reed fen plots quite rapidly developed a, a distinctive character um this is a a, a picture taken from the inside of one of those plots in may um so they've got a nice kind of like patchy canopy of Phragmites and Cladium, lots of tussocks. Um, we're particularly proud of our, our tussocks and talk about them a lot. Um, and then sparse, patchy, lower vegetation as well. Um, and this really is, is uh, just the, the result of the planting and then vegetative spread of some of these species. We've done very little management in there. We do weed wipe great, greater reed mace, type of um, and snip off willow saplings. But other than that, there's been very little management to date. Um, so this is great, you know, that they've developed a, a very distinctive structure. Um, this would be something like, if you're familiar with the national vegetation classification, or, I, I know you won't all be, um, this is, is um, intended to be like a, a northern version of um, species-rich reed fen. Um, so the, uh, the, 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 uh, 
Phragmites um, milk parsley um, reach pen, as it's described in the NVC. Um, what we have found is that over time, Phragmites has become increasingly dominant in the wetter parts of these plots. So the wetter offshore um, areas are becoming increasingly like Phragmites dominated reed bed, and we're starting to lose that structural diversity. So that's clearly something we've either got to accept, you know, it's not the worst outcome in the world, but it's not what we intended, um, uh, or we've got to find ways of managing the Phragmites. So we are starting to do some late summer cutting. Um, we'd like to graze, but there's obvious practical difficulties with it. We did do one um, plot further um, onshore, so at the drier end of the, the reed fen spectrum. So this is an area that just it, it, at the moment it'll have kind of ankle deep water and then it dries out in summer. Um, one thing that's worth noting is, is that the silt that we're using as a substrate, um, it has a strong what you call a, a capillary fringe. So it actually draws up water in summer. So although you can walk over it in, in training shoes, um, the, the plant roots um, you know, are still in a, a very moist environment, which is, is obviously advantageous. Um, so this is now a really species rich plot. It has about 50 species in it, including bryophytes. Um, quite a lot of those have turned up you know, purely of their own accord. So there's things like Northern Marsh Orchid have appeared spontaneously. It's really nicely structured vegetation. It's very difficult to convey this in a photograph. Um, this has got a fantastic structure, but whenever you photograph it, it just looks like, just looks green, really. Um, haven't really found a sort of like a, a way around that, but um, if you maybe have 3D glasses on, you could, uh, you could appreciate that. So again, um, it's got these tall species like the cladium you can see in flower. Um, it's got lots of tussocks. It's got much more of a, a kind of like a mid-height understory. So that's primarily species like um, uh, purple small reed, uh, that's Calamogrostis canescens, the blood-flowered rush, the purple moorgrass, Melinia chirulia. Um, below that, it's got a nice species-rich low herb layer um, and, uh, and lots of bryophytes. So really, really interesting thing with this plot is the crassula is decreasing and decreasing very markedly. There's barely any of it left. And it actually seems to be being replaced by pointed spear moss, uh, Caliurganella cuspidata, um, which of course is a great outcome, but it's really interesting. And I, I wish we had the, the kind of expertise and the time and so on to actually trace why that was happening. Um, it's not pure competition or shading. Um, because the crassula is still there in some of the plots that are much more densely shaded and more densely dominated by, by tall plants. Um, so something's built going on there, something to do with the complexity of the habitat, um, I, I suspect. So that's worked tremendously well, and we're really, really proud um, of, of that plot. We've started mowing it mainly to ensure that uh, Calamogrostis canescens doesn't become dominant because in some situations that can become a quite a thuggish grass. So the, another community that's been really successful has been Great Fence Edge Swamp, Cladium Swamp. Um, this is uh, coded S2 in the National Vegetation Classification. Um, and we know from, you know, uh, uh, peak cores from local wetlands that that's been an important plant community, you know, throughout the post-glacial period in this area. You might expect that because we're talking about predominantly um, alkaline groundwater. Um, cladium is well suited to mass production in the nursery. Uh, once um, Pan and Laurie had, had um, <coughs> mastered the, the germination of, the, of, of this species, which took some time, I'm sure they'll mention, um, we're able to just produce this you know, on a, a production line. Um, it survives extremely well, it flowers in its second year, um, and it starts spreading um, quite rapidly, at, at least in, in the conditions that we have. And we're hoping that, um, you know, provided it all survives the next couple of years, this will be the largest area of Great Fence Edge Swamp in, in Yorkshire. Um, I think the, the largest other areas are, are less than 0.1 of a, a hectare. So we're probably gonna double the, the kind of like the regional resource of this habitat. And, you know, this is a, a plant community that is, is nationally um, uncommon. So, so that in itself is, 
is quite an achievement. You can see that the lower photo is is kind of like this is um, uh, two year old planting, so it doesn't take long to establish. Um, <clears throat> and Cladium um, Swamp is a great alternative to Phragmites dominated reed bed. So in continental Europe, um, species that we think of as entirely associated with um, Phragmites reed beds, like like bitten, for instance. Um, uh, inhabit cladium swamps um, and some of the, the the kind of the fen birds are, are actually you know prefer um, cladium to uh, to phragmites um, it can be very good for for um, birds like crakes and rails and, and cranes and so on and now there's a photo of a great white egret that we've got currently um, in the fen creation area that uh, that Laurie took last week the other plant community that's uh, that we've been really successful with has been uh, S1 Carixillata tufted sedge swamp. This is a really distinctive local community. I know it's sort of uncommon um, uh, across the, uh, Britain. Um, we have uh, in the lower Ewer Valley, there's a particular concentration of um, sinkholes. They're natural sinkholes where gypsum caves subside underground and then the ground collapses to form these <clears throat> often rather circular or, or they're like an inverted cone, <clears throat> um, these depressions that sometimes fill with ground mortar and they're known as locally as dubs. And they often have a fringe of these um, sedge tussocks around the margin of them. So it's a very, very distinctive community. So we've tried to kind of like reflect that in our creation. So we've got um, a band of tufted sedge swamp uh, along the, uh, the drawdown zone. Um, very, very interesting species. Uh, the Americans have the same species, but they call it Carex stricta. Um, and the University of Wisconsin, herbar um, not herbarium, um, for the word I'm thinking of. Uh, the, the University of Wisconsin have done, the Arboretum, that's it, um, have, uh, have done lots of research on, on what they call Carex stricta, because it's also the dominant plant of um, what are called sedge meadows. Effectively, they are uh, they are sedge dominated um, uh, cattle holes um, in the the prairie states of the, of the northern USA, um, and they describe it as a restoration super plant because um, not only does it create habitat, but the these tussocks, these long lived tussocks, are very good at sequestering nutrients and carbon, um, you know, they're, they're, they're full of organic materials. So they, they actually lock up a lot of carbon. Um, they create structural complexity. Um, and because they're very three dimensional, they create lots of micro habitats. And that varies from shaded pools in between the tussocks um, to the, the, the kind of epiphytic habitats where um, bryophytes and uh, um, small um, uh, forbs um, actually start growing on the tussocks themselves. Um, this is one of the sedges that we found is really easily propagated from seed. Um, it needs to be very fresh seed, uh, but once it gets going, um, you can't really stop it. Uh, there is a technique for actually speeding up tussock production. Tussocks are basically growths of vertical rhizome in response to fluctuating water levels. So if you take a young plant and drown it, and then let it out again and drown it again, um, it will start to form a tussock quite rapidly. Um, and we find very promising results here, as you can see in the upper picture, you've got this will be three or four year old um, planting that, that is, is, is forming a very distinctive structure there. And the lower photograph is one of our um, some work we've done helping the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust create marginal fen on one of their sites. And these are two year old plants and they're already forming huge tussocks. You'd think they've been there for, for decades. So. That's been pretty successful. And we're getting similar results as well using the more widespread Carex paniculata, greater tussock sedge. Um, various other um, stands of vegetation that we've planted. We've, we've ended up with a bit of a mishmash, but that's partly been you know, due to the, the stop start nature of the, the project. So we have done quite a lot of planting of bladder sedge, Carex vesicaria, and bottle sedge, Carex rostrata. Um, we particularly favour these sedges because they create fantastic habitat for invertebrates and fish fry. Um, we've deliberately avoided really thuggish things like Carex riparia, 
character tutor and character tutor formis um, because they they choke out everything else and fauna can't kind of like penetrate stands of them. Um, they're so dense and they produce such a deep litter layer that they produce a very different kind of habitat. Um, so we've concentrated on these kind of like mid-size um, sedges and they've worked reasonably well, although it has to be said they're pretty slow um, to get going. The lower photograph is, uh, it's not actually the same site, it's another part of the nature reserve. Um, and these are stands of, of carrots rostrata um, that really, after they were initially planted, they literally did nothing for about five years. And then they've gradually taken off and are now pretty good habitat. Um, we're probably at the upper sort of limit of the trophic tolerances of these sedges. Um, it's more eutrophic than the sites where you'd normally expect to find Carex rostrata in, in particular. Um, so we're not optimistic about developing the kind of species rich Carex rostrata fens that you might find in uh, cleaner water landscapes. So we have tried planting things like slender sedge Carex lassiocarp and bog bean and um, uh, marsh sangfoil and so on, but they've, uh, they've, they really haven't sort of like taken off. The conditions are too enriched for them. We've got quite a, a reasonable area of a uh, fen meadow. So this is um, really intended to be a, a mosaic of kind of um, blood cloud rush fen meadow, which is the one of the characteristic local plant communities um, and drier types of species rich reed fen. Um, it has to be said, you know, this has been slow to mature. Um, there is some vegetative regeneration and a few plants are starting to recruit from seed, but it's been a slow process. One of the problems has been that until last year, um, the marauding rabbits just literally, you know, at every single flower head. So there was just no, no recruitment from seed going on at all. Um, we've got more secure fencing in now and, and things are starting to take off. But it will be a while until we can actually claim, you know, hopefully that this is a, a kind of like a self-organizing plant community. It has great potential, though. Um, this is a um, you get a little bit of surface water flooding, but the main source of water here is the uh, the ingress of, of groundwater from from higher ground. Uh, so this is much less nutrient rich. It's less strongly influenced by the uh, the lake water quality, um, and there's relatively little trassula in this habitat. So potentially, um, this could be really exciting if it takes off and actually starts to, to develop its own characteristics. And we're then gonna be able to manage it by, by mowing or grazing. So the work we've been doing on um, local wetlands is, is part of a, a wider project. I, I've, I've mentioned some of the, the other things we do. Um, so it's tied in with uh, restoration work and other sites. So these photos you can see here, um, that's, that's Laurie with his hat on in the, um, the uh, top um, left photo. This is, is managing um, an undergrazed Juncus subnodulosus fen. It's a lovely site, it's quite a big site, relatively speaking, about six hectares of a very nice fen there, um, but it, it, it's undermanaged. So we, we are, are mowing um, some plots and, and hopefully in time there will be better grazing management on that site. The, the top right side so slide it, photo even um, is removing red osier dogwood, um, which is a horrible invasive um, shrub uh, from a, a fen site um, near the River Ewer in Ripon. Um, and then the bottom photo is, is managing a species rich road verge near Richmond. So one of the, the benefits that we have from doing this work as well as managing neglected habitats is we're able to collect seeds and cuttings from these sites um, and, and it produces a, you know, a, a really positive relationship with the, with the landowners. You know, they're, they're keen to, to get help managing these sites. Um, they get an added interest and we're able to, to then, you know, collect seeds from their, their lands. Um, and uh, we use the, the, the green hay rather than treating it as a, as a waste product and taking it to, you know, to compost at the local um, waste disposal uh, site, we, we use this um, to spread on, on you know, new habitat creation plots. 
Another aspect of what we're doing is, is work on a, a series of rare plant species. So some of this is for our own um, use, like the, the tufted loosestrife. Um, there's a, a, a project to uh, reintroduce water gemander um, at a Yorkshire Wildlife Trust site. It's a very well-documented historic site for water gemander not far from us. Um, and several other species we are, are you know, working for other people. Um, scarce tufted sedge, Carex cespitosa. We're doing work propagating that for the uh, the Hearts and Middlesex Wildlife Trust. Um, we're providing plants of greater water parsnip, Styum latifolium, um, to the the Tees Valley Wildlife Trust. Again, uh, that's a reintroduction at a well documented historic site. So um, this all ties in with the the wetland creation work we're doing. And now to go back to the nursery, I'm going to hand you over to to Pan and Laurie. Oh, good evening, everybody. Sorry about the slow transfer. Had a few hiccups with getting the slideshow up. But uh, carrying on from Martin's work, I'll just run through some of the uh, work to construct our growing facilities. As Martin's shown this image before. This is what we're aiming to revegetate. And these plots are our original trials, which we used some green hay and some seed on them, but very little response really. We've got to, as Martin said, some uh, a few things germinating and growing away. But most of the, what we did didn't yield anything. So uh, we decided that we probably needed another method using plants. And we needed to generate these plants. So decision was made to start a small nursery to be run by the volunteers and produce enough plants to vegetate around the uh, Nosterfield site that did expand in, later on to supplying plants to other sites, which is a good thing. Um, now, Pan and I got involved because we'd run a commercial nursery for 28 years and knew how to produce numbers of plants. And we also had a previous background in university research on botanical, well, plant-based projects. So we were used to researching the material, um, which we've had to do a fair amount of research. And Martin's already mentioned some of the problems that we was, might suffer from, which are the rabbits, geese, and some other pests. We also have no running water or electricity on site, uh, which is a bit of a problem in a nursery. So we've had to adapt round that. Oops, where are we? Our first trial production site was just a small enclosure um, leveled out and again a lot of volunteer work and that was 2017 we started that and we wanted a system. We thought a lot of these wetland plants would need deep water. So we constructed a deep water bed, which is fed from water in a storage tank. And that's filled by pumping from the lagoon. And it was moderately successful, but we soon realized it was quite small. We put in a second bed, 
and we've also put in a capillary watering bed in the middle but we soon realized we didn't need deep water for many of the plants when they come out of their natural environment and you've removed all the com competition a lot of them will survive even if they're just kept moist hence the capillary we also knew that from our commercial days because we did grow a few wildflowers and we could um, grow water mint marsh marigold ladies smock more or less like bedding plants so we tried that with lots of these wetland plants that have been collected and it's reasonably successful with a few exceptions however we soon outgrew this little site here and um, it was decided we'd go on to something a bit bigger so whoops we've got this commercial tunnel just a small one but we did put two wet beds in and uh, an area of capillary matting to grow the plants on this has enabled us to produce a lot of young material for potting on and as martin said you know 20000 plants a year can come out of this um, we have quite a huge mixture, which Pan will go into in a minute. And this is all run by two more storage tanks, 10,000 litres. And that will take us through a week in midsummer. And we pump once a week to refill it. And we've also got a lot of battery operated valve blocks because we've only got volunteers on site twice a week so we had to ensure that the survival of the plants it was all going to be automated uh, no electricity so battery units and they've really been quite successful um You're producing all these younger plants and you've got to pot them on and they take up a lot more space so we've expanded outside and just with simple beds a wooden frame with capillary matting in they can hold about two centimeters of water maximum but we've got very good survival and growth of most of the species we've tried one or two hiccups but i th most of the uh, time we keep them watered and they're okay we have put some sprinkler lines over it now which we can use when the pumps are running and give it a good dousing about once a week um and I think here we've got cladium in, uh, I think, a trays of 15, but we take them up to litre size. The production, we tried to keep it simple by standardising on plug sizes, pot sizes, and litre is about the biggest we'd want to plant out in some of the wetter areas, because... Uh, it gets a bit difficult taking larger plants out. Uh, we've had a few hiccups with plants floating out again, because we are quite often working in 10, 15 centimetres of water to do planting. And it all seems to work very well. We These beds here, I suppose there's about some um, six seven thousand plants when these are full and we have developed some other areas we've put in a display bed for visitors to see some of the 
more unusual plants. Uh, the lily pond was so we could generate some white water lily for trial planting. Um, and that's about 60 centimetres deep. But some other things do prefer deep water. Schoenoplectus lacustris, club rush. That does do a lot better in deeper water. So we've used these IBC containers, uh, these bulk containers you see farmers using to water their sheep with. And we'll cut the tops off so we can have a meter of water in there. And this also lends it, it can be used for the tussocking experiments that we've done. Uh, easily change the water volumes in them, move them up and down. And it's, it's reasonably successful. Other tanks, we've got a few aquatic species. So this is a cattle trough. I think it's about 100, uh, yeah, 1,500 litres in there when full. So that gives us a good selection. And we are going to be introducing some more pond areas with uh, rainwater collected from some roof material. And uh, that's uh, an experimental stage. Uh, which we have come to. I think uh, the slides disappeared there. It should have been the map of the nursery. But overall, production can go ahead. Our main problem is getting the material flowing through the nursery to. So we've got to keep the flow of the plants required going smoothly but we can hold plants sort of freeze them in time by not potting them on just keep them fed properly and it works reasonably well so i think the transfer on to pandora and the actual plant growing Right, well, here we have a few stats about the kinds of plant collections we, we do. I've put them on a slide because I've got, obviously got to forget this, but we try and collect seed from more than one site locally. And this just gives you a vague idea of what we, we do. And when I looked, I found that about 10% of the plants that we grow happen to be on the BSBI um, red list so this this is just a few of them and this uh top one is tufted loosestrife and martin showed another picture of this with which was flowering this is the only one we've ever seen flower on site because the flowers are eaten by deer we suspect this is one of our areas of seed propagation we, we were finding in the main greenhouse that we were losing an awful lot of seedlings to voles. So the bottom section is a, an extension that we put on, on the greenhouse um, to help keep our precious seedlings away from voles. Um, some of the plants that we're growing, once you get them out of their habitat we found that they were really quite easy to grow um in a nursery and uh some of them like uh, marsh pea and so on are really quite vigorous so we we will try and grow about 110 species from seeds something like that um and we where we know what exactly what they need like some species will will just be germinate easily in the, in the spring. That's what we do. Other ones like um, marsh marigold, that will germinate readily, but only if the seed's very fresh. And as Martin has mentioned, Carex elatus, another one like that. 
So if we know what these species want, that's what we give them. But otherwise, everything else, we tend to give them a cold treatment because it saves a lot of space. If I just go backwards, maybe. Um, you can see how much space on the floor all these seed trays are taking up. And if the seed needs a cold treatment, so it's going to sit there for four months, we'd rather have the seed in bags. So what we, in a fridge, so what we do is we do a moist stratification over winter. So we, with about 80 species, we just um, treat the seed, keep it in seed bags in a domestic fridge. And after about a month, start pulling the seed lots out. And if there's any germination, then we take it to the nursery and start sowing it. So that instead of having lots and lots of these seed trays hanging about for four or five months, um, we don't actually need that space until the plants have started to germinate. So after the seed's been in the fridge for about a month, we'll start looking at it maybe once or twice a week and pull out those plants, those um, seed lots that have germinated. Um, when we get to a, about 14 weeks, if things haven't germinated, then we take all the lots out and just leave them at ambient temperature inside the house. So there's a certain amount of uh, night day variation in temperature. And also they get light because some species need light for germination. So we keep going through them again and then anything that hasn't germinated by about the end of May, we take the seed lots to the uh, polytunnel where they, where we just lay them out, cover them with um, some white fleece, and then they get really extreme day-night variations in temperature. And quite a lot of the plants need that. Um, many of the sedges, so they won't actually germinate until there's a really big difference, day-night germination. And I'll just move on to one of our specialities which is great fence edge and we now as martin said we now know how to propagate this the first thing it needs is a really long post-harvest maturation period months so we collect the seed we just keep it in a hessian sack just as, as seed heads all over the winter and then sometime the following spring um we thresh out the seed and then give it a really thorough um, treatment in between um, sandpaper so that you take all the, the outer utricle off, all the material underneath, which is very buoyant because these seeds will float. And underneath that, you've got a really dense, dark gray, very, very tough little seed. And we keep rubbing until that's fairly well scratched. And then we probably won't, won't bother sowing the seed until late April, early May, and then it usually will um, germinate quite readily. As you can see in that bottom corner, there's quite a lot of seedlings. It germinates reasonably reliably, so we can actually grow it in plug plants as well. Um, it's pretty slow in its first year, and then it starts to grow quite rapidly after that. So something that was germinated maybe um, in June this year, say, which would have been last year's seed, will be ready to plant out next year, probably. Right, I'll just giving you, give you a few examples of other things we grow. Martin's mentioned some of the, the other sites that we have. Oh, seem to have gone to slideshow. This is one of the things he, he mentioned, which is rare spring sedge. So this occurs on a, a little local nature reserve. Um, a very, very small area, say six metres by one and a half metres. Um, and that, it's so it's very, very vulnerable. It's alongside a, a public footpath. And you can see how tiny it is after the cladium because this stick is nine centimetres tall and the top of it, the flat piece, is less than a centimetre wide. So you can see how minute this little... Flowerheads. So that's the main male flowers. This is the female bit here. So this is a triple SI. So we needed natural England consent. So we had to first make sure there were enough flowering plants there. So we went in May 
saw that there were a hundred flowering heads and we got permission from Natural England to collect 10 heads. And I'm glad to say that we have managed to germinate it. And um, even if we don't get any more germinate uh, this year, and we're hoping that we will, because some of them are undergoing, some of the seeds undergoing a, a treatment in the fridge, um, the earlier ones are growing well enough for us to be able to split them. So we'll have an arc population and possibly plants to supplement um, the original population. Another of the plants that we are doing is water germander, as Martin's mentioned. This is for a reintroduction project at Bolton on Swale Lake, where there's very good evidence to show that that plant existed before. And it's a really weird plant because it just overwinters only through stolons on the bottom right of your screen. You can see a little tiny stolon, which is just rooted in water. And the top left hand shows the original plant and that completely rots away. And only these bits that stolon that break up survive over winter. And this plant is really vulnerable to draining drainage for that reason. So it's obviously a plant of dynamic river systems where you get a bit of trampling with animals and these quite brittle stolons will break off and float away and establish somewhere else. And as soon as you, you get drainage, this plant will soon die out. So it's really quite vulnerable because it only occurs in a couple of sites in the UK, but we've managed to bulk it up and it, we planted some at Bolton on Swale and it's still it's still alive as far as we know, but we've got plenty in cultivation to have another go, if anything, should anything unpleasant happen. Um, we found that when we had it in the nursery, it's not particularly attractive to most um, grazing animals. Um, I'll just mention a couple of experimental things that we've tried. So we've tried uh, growing plants in just ordinary, ordinary hessian sacks. It's partly to speed up planting and also it makes it safer when you're trying to, to work in shallow water. So we find about 10, um, 10 litres of compost in one of these sacks. This is ordinary hessian sand bag with a lot of gravel to keep the plants down. Um, we use the, these sandbags, grow flat like that for um, tufted loose strife, the smaller sedges for cladium as well. And they establish quite well. And within about a couple of months, these sandbags completely rot away. You have to be a bit careful with the timing because you've got about 28 days from when you plant them up to when they start to disintegrate. So we aim to plant them as soon as the roots come out of the bottom. And for um, bigger plants, we have some, what they call, the manufacturers call rot-proof hessian bags, but they're not rot-proof at all. They just rot slower. They're covered in a sort of green wax. So we, we use them, cut them in half vertically, and that's a, a big cladium plant. And this is us, at uh, Yorkshire Wildlife site, um, planting some. Uh, Martin also mentioned tussocking, and this, I don't know if you can see it, but the right hand pot shows vertical. These are roots growing out from the surface of the pot and they grow vertically. We found that we made sort of homemade pots out of polythene bags. And as you keep inundating the plants, you get these vertical um, roots growing and you can fill that area with debris or compost and then roll the back of the bag up a bit and keep repeating that process. And you can therefore get your tussocking to happen much quicker than uh, planting them out. Because we suspect that some of these really big tussocks, maybe hundreds of years old, um, so we try all sorts of things like this, and mostly they seem to have worked. And that is what the pen looks like now. And uh, I'll hand back with that, hand back to Billy. 
was absolutely brilliant. Like I, I love, I love plant ecology and plant propagation. They're like two of my favorite areas. So that was a really fascinating talk. Thank you. Um, so we'll move on to the Q and A session. Um, and there's been a few questions popped through, but I will remind the audience that if they've got any questions, now's the time to put them in the Q and A, in the Q and A bit. So we'll start with a question from David Can. And I'll direct this question towards uh, Laurie and Pandora. Uh, do you find growing on site helps with reduced biosecurity risks compared to growing on an existing nursery? Um, yes, it probably does. But we we have to be very careful when taking plants off the nursery because we've got this horrible infestation of Crassula. Um, so biosecurity is not such a problem for plants coming in as it is but we need to be quite careful going out okay um i had a i had a question that i i guess i guess might relate to that um has there been any sort of like uh thought about like the introduction of like that um that crassula mite that helps to um control some populations or is it not really a, a, a consideration we we had a we did consider that, but um, I can't remember what it needs, but the mite either it needs some period when it where the crassula is either underwater or out of the water, and ours we is just everywhere. It's in the water and out of the water. It, this the conditions didn't seem entirely suitable for the mite to work, but we'll we'll see how other people get on. Has there been any sort of like mechanical removal of, of the crassula or is it is it just too risky to, to touch it? We have tried <laughs> mechanical extraction, but it's very labour intensive mm. and it's only a short term thing. Mm. We have tried some chemical control, but again, it's only short term. And I did try burning with a flame gun, but again, the crassula just comes back. So biological control is the way to go if somebody could sort something out. Or, as is happening in one of the Fen Meadow plots, we find a way that um, other plants can outcompete it. Mm. But um, the, I'll just say the sandbag technique for planting means you can establish other plants where there is a problem with crassula because you're dropping the sandbag on top of it and the plant the target plants will root away through everything and get a good root system established before the crassula spreads over the top of the sandbag area it, it is worth emphasizing i think that um <clears throat> the, the tall monocotyledon so things like great fence edge and the carrack species things like that, are really, they're not fast at all. No. Uh, you know, the crassula does not affect them one little bit. It's the it's the rosette-forming forbs and the species that disappear below the surface um, in uh, in winter um, that then, you know, meet this smothering sort of blanket when they try and re-emerge in spring. Um, they're the species that, that are, you know, can't compete with it. So going on, on from that, Martin, uh, Jonathan has asked the question of, is Phragmites increase a consequence of nutrication? I'm just kind of tagging it on because you said about like the smothering of smaller species. Um, I mean, Phragmites will certainly be encouraged by high nutrient levels. I think it's just uh, an effect of, of maturation of the, the plots in our case. I mean, with hindsight, we probably wouldn't have included Phragmites um, in the plantings. Um, however, it has come in spontaneously. Once you exclude grazing animals, Phragmites is one of the species that will get there spontaneously, and it has incredibly long rhizomes, and uh, if it's anywhere near, it will get there anyway. Um, I think Phragmites has specifically taken off in the um, deeper water in our plot, so we had relatively deep water. Our water levels just absolutely ping pong all over the place partly to do with the operation of the quarry um so we you know it, it's very hard for us to control but high water levels high stable water levels definitely benefit phragmites um and, and it has become you know it, it is a, a problem for us in those wet reed fen 
much. Um, so going on from the grazing, have you noticed any sort of like grazing from um, like east or anything like that? Because um, where I'm from in Cornwall, we've got a, a rather large uh, reserve, or not reserve, a, a reservoir. And the margins of this reservoir, they are just cropped really, really short by just hundreds and hundreds of um, Canada geese. So I wondered whether or not. Um, yeah. I mean, we are kind of like Greyland Goose City. Um, you know, there are massive numbers of them. They have been less of a problem than we anticipated, but that's probably because we've been quite good at excluding them. Um, first of all, we thought that we'd have to have like really quite small enclosures to discourage the geese, but in effect, any kind of like offshore barrier, they'd like to swim on. They're not going to sort of like fly into these shoreline areas. Um, so as long as you maintain a, a robust offshore barrier, you will keep them out most of the time. Um, we did do so early on. We did a, a, a trail cam experiment, um, sort of like looking at some unprotected planting. And what we actually found is when they found it, the way that the greyland geese graze, they, they must bite off the buds below the surface or something um, because it didn't make the plants tiller, as you might expect. It just killed them. They never get back. Um, so, you know, greyland can definitely become a problem. I've known sites personally. I know one site where Carex rostrata has just been completely eliminated um, by, by geese on a... Um, a, a very what have been a very nice reservoir site, so it can be a problem. Um, and we have, you know, we have this system of of um, uh, reusable mesh panels that are, that are supported by by road pins, um, and it's very quick and easy to put up, and you can use it over and over again. Um, it's initially expensive, and, and you know, it has been a big sort of cost item for us, but it does work well. I would emphasise though that once things are established. All the things that we have, have you know, spent five years trying to deter, the, the deer, the bunnies, the, the geese and so on, they will be our friends. We will even live in harmony with the damn rabbits, um, you know, once things are established. Grazing will be, you know, they're a natural part of wetland ecosystems. We will want them back. Um, it's just if you're going to try creating habitats by planting plants, you don't want them eaten in the first year, obviously. Oh, that was a brilliant answer. Thank you, Martin. Um, so we've got a question here. I'm going to direct it to Laurie and Pandora again. Do you think lack of genetic diversity is an issue when propagating from a small donor population such that seeds of rare species should be collected from multiple sites? Well, I think that de depends what your, um, your intentions are. I mean, in our case, we're trying to preserve the, the local provenance. If you were trying to, for example, get a, a sample for putting into the Millennium Q Bank, then you would definitely want to go and sample populations all over the, um, the country. But in our case, we're going to the little tiny bits of remnant wetland as close to our site as possible and getting plant material from as many sites as possible. But yeah, we recognise that we might have quite a genetic, small genetic pool to be yeah. taking from. We do, do ensure that everything is recorded accurately. Everything's got acquisition numbers so we can trace it all the way back um, just to make certain we're keeping thing, some things pure, especially the plants that come in from other areas in the country that we've been asked to prop up. You know, we do want to keep them separate all the time. Okay, thank you. Um, so I've got a question here from uh, from Jonathan uh, Shanklin, and he says, does the uh, water demander propagate from seed? Yes, they do. Um, but they, it propagates really easily from just cuttings it does propagate from seed you can we've grown it from seed as well in the nursery but for some reason it doesn't seem to be a really important part of its propagation in the wild it seems to be these stolons um over winter because quite often yeah. the plant I, I... the plant quite often collapses in the wild before the seeds ripe mm. 
I, like you said, uh, like you said in your talk, I should imagine that's probably as a result of it living in um, like flood plains where the, yes. where the soil is, is quite unstable. Um, so we've got a uh, another question here um, from Jackie Carter, and uh, it's directed at you, Pandora. So mm -hmm. you mentioned that some plants need strong day-night temperature variations. Yes. And is climate change impacting these species due to milder winters with less day to night temperature variation? I don't know. I, in the long term, it may well do. But um, I think these um, sedge, it, primarily the sedge species, uh, uh, have evolved to germinate where there is still a space for them in late spring. So um, I think it's a protection against germinating too early in the spring and then being overshadowed by other plants. So it seems to be um, a natural thing for them. Mm, okay. It may well change. I mean, like um, commercially, they've had to cha change how they deal with um, black currants because the old species that needed a, a big uh, cold winter um, don't didn't don't flower anymore. So in the long term, it may become a problem. Yes, I, I guess in the, I guess in the in the short term, for your purposes, it's not too much of a too much well, of an issue. We're, we're getting quite old, so it's not going <laughs> to. <laughs> um, so, uh, got a question from uh, Jono uh, Leadley, and he said, "Hi, fantastic talk, thank you." So. Martin mentioned trying to assemble plant communities typical of this part of the world. Are there any species that should be part of these communities that have been impossible to propagate or have you cracked everything? I uh, definitely haven't cracked everything. Um, amongst the things that we've tried, we haven't had success yet with, um, uh, what's it called, um, marsh... Um, um, Stitchwort. Stitchwort, thank you. <laughs> the, first, the first collection we had, the... Um, I mean, it might have been interesting to people who are interested in fungi, but all, all, there was a smut on all the seed. And the second lot that we've collected haven't germinated yet, but I have hopes that they might germinate after a, a treatment over winter. But would I mean, you, would, you that, would, would you say that that's been your most most difficult species? To, to it has been there, quite or? tricky, yes. Hmm. Has, has there been one particular species that's been quite satisfying to like finally work out what? Oh, it's cladium. Yeah. <laughs> well, one thing I'll just mention is that we've been surprised on the nursery that we haven't had much in the way of disease problem, which commercially um, you would have all sorts of problems with the conditions we're using. But we have run into a few surprises in that we get some interesting pests um, which are specific to say a carex. We've had an aphid in. We had a sawfly that demolished some of our first crops of carex elata. We thought a rabbit had had it, but it was a whole <laughs> collection of sawfly had more or less taken square meters of it down over a weekend no. are, 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 are these pests are, are they are they native pests so oh, yes. are, are oh, they, yeah. they're, they're, they're acting how they would i guess mm. i guess in the yeah. wild but i think now we've got a more balanced system and they, the the problem those problems have disappeared we will see others in the future i'm sure but it's do, do you have, it is do, in do you, relation to john's question um it is interesting that the, the disparities in the way that the you know plants germinate. So, for instance, with the rare spring sedge, we got a, a tiny handful of you know, there's literally individual seeds um, that has grown okay, and we've got lovely plants coming on. We also collected you know from various other sites lots of of spring sedge. It's much much more widespread relative. Nothing's germinated at all. Um, well, you know, we do actually find, ironically, that rare plants are often relatively easy to grow in nursery conditions. It's just they can't compete in, you know, the habitats uh, in the uh, out in the, the wild. Um, so, you know, we, we 
take the view that at least we can sort of maintain our populations of some of those species. So if something went terribly wrong on the donor sites, at least we would have locally well provenance local material um, to potentially um, go back onto those uh, those sites. Yeah, what, when I said that there aren't many things that we haven't been able to produce, we haven't been able to do them all from seed. So in many cases where we've ended up propagating them vegetatively. Um, so kind of like going on from what Martin just said, um, are there any sort of like plants that you keep, like rare plants that you keep within the nursery to like take cuttings of, or like seeds from that, that you just like keep around in the nursery instead of just like planting them out? Into the, we do. The I mean, we, from Thornborough Henges, we've, we've got Dyer's Greenweed and uh, we've it, it hadn't flowered on the henge because the henge was always grazed. And so we had got some stock plants. We have to protect them and our other stock plants that we do collect seed from in the nursery, mainly from roe deer. You know, you can be watching them and think, oh, yes, I'll collect that seed next week. And the roe deer will come in and eat the stuff overnight. Mm. Um, so, Martin, I've got a question for you. Um, someone in the audience, Ben B, is uh, saying that uh, he'd like to know a little bit more about the, the research of Carexolata in the United States and where you might be able to find out a little bit more about it. Yeah, so if you go on to our, um, the LUCT website, um, so it's luct.org.uk, and then I think if you look along the menu, there's um, a section on plant propagation, you might have to sort of like go through the, the drop down um, menus on the headers. Um, if you look at that, we've actually got, well, there's quite a lot of information there. So, for example, we've got results of, of our sort of like germination trials and so on for lots and lots of different species. Um, we've got um, the practical methods like the sandbag planting method. Um, we've got a, uh, a propagation protocol for great fence sedge. And we've also got one for tufted sedge. If you find that, it's a PDF. Um, it's all free. Um, uh, please have a look at it. And in there, it gives some of the references um, to the work that's been done. There's a, a series of papers, and it was the, the um, people at the Arboretum of the University of Wisconsin um, who've, who've been particularly researching what they call Carrick Stricter. Brilliant, thank you, Martin. Uh, so we've got another question here. What was the main reason why direct seeding of plants was not successful? Well, we, we, we didn't don't know. know the viability <laughs> of the seed that we had or the actual volume of it. Um, you know, it was going onto bare soil, so there wasn't any competition effect. Um, we just had no real answer. At the time, we weren't researching it correctly. M Martin may, may have ideas yeah. on that. I, I think fen plants in general... Um, rely less on, on seed production than, say, grassland plants. I mean, I've had, you know, I've been doing grassland creation work for, you know, 30 plus years. And, you know, you can get great results from green hay, you can get great results from dried hay bales. Um, uh, you know, but with the, the wetland plants, it doesn't seem to, direct seed transfer doesn't seem to work in the same way. And we've had some, yeah, and, and, and the seedlings also seem to be particularly vulnerable with some of the fen plants it's like we've had some um initially the the germination has looked okay and quite diverse and then a year later you know we've got one plot and we've there's nothing but yellow flag left we've got another plot there's nothing but millennia um left so that there is quite a narrow range of species that that take readily on a prepared seedbed um you know hence all the you know um, growing plants is not the most sort of speedy or you know um, uh, cost effective option really but we we just came to the conclusion that to create these sort of habitats on a significant scale we would need to look at, at planting um, and then of course these plants you know many of them like the cladium like the um, juncus nodulosus and so on they uh, um, you know will rapidly uh, expand um, vegetatively um, we have found some species do see themselves in. So one of our new um, Caracillata plots is, uh, is just covered in uh, in seedlings, for example. 
but I think that's probably relatively rare, and I think they have very, very specific um, conditions that they require. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so I've got a question. Um, do you do much community outreach stuff uh, with, with your nursery as well? Do you, do you reach out to local schools or anything like that? And get yeah, so, so we've, we've got a project officer, um, uh, Emma, who, who um, yeah, she's doing a lot of work at the moment as a part of a lottery funded project on on outreach and so we have, yeah we have all sorts of quite a, you know a big volunteer team and community volunteering days um and uh, we do lots of sort of like bits of training and sort of learning plant identification and stuff like that uh, we have lots of volunteer surveyors who you know are out there recording butterfly transects bird recording and uh, and all that kind of thing um and you know we have lots of people come and visit the, the nursery so, I mean, we're, you know, we're always uh, anybody who um, wants to see more um, or chat to us more and, and happens to be in that part of North Yorkshire, um, you're always welcome to come. Um, I mean, it, it's Tuesdays and Fridays are the days that we tend to be there. Um, and obviously, you know, we, we need a little bit of notice, but um, you're very welcome to come and, and, and look round and we'll, we'll show you the, the habitat creation areas and the... Uh, and the nursery so we have lots of, of groups come and visit we've got the chartered institute of horticulture coming in the near future um we've got the um uh, the wildflower society coming um later in the, the the summer um lots and lots of sort of like groups like that come come to visit so um yeah you know you're always welcome brilliant thank you um so going back to the pests in the nursery, do you implement any sort of like integrated pest management at all? We try not to do much at all, but if we, if we have, um, say, an outbreak of aphids that's really getting out of control, we'll perhaps use a, a wetter or something on it, soft soap, something similar. Um, mainly you see, you, you notice pests in the nursery because it's just a bit more protected, it's a bit warmer, the plants grow a bit more lushly, so they're just more attractive than the the outside plants, really. But we don't know. We try. We, oh, we do tr try and um, kill some of the mice. I'm afraid because they just eat all our seedlings. So we've got some of these New Zealand uh, humane traps that have a, like a captive bolt that fires with um, with gas. So we we do try and control those. We do try and keep the birds, uh, the deer the rabbits out. Um, do you experience any issues with like waterborne diseases at all? With, with the no, water not really. Spiders? Surprisingly not. I mean, some of the, the water in some of these standing beds has been there for ages. And the, the, these wetland plants seem to be really pretty tough things. Because if we tried that with the kinds of plants that we used to grow, yes, they would all be going down with diseases quite readily. Yeah, because yeah, I um I, I know that in like some commercial setups that have like the, the space and the money and the time, they they have a water filtration systems that go through great big like yeah. beds of yellow flag iris or something like that. And because of all the bacterial films and all that that live in the root systems of these plants, it outcompetes all of like the the, the nasty waterborne diseases that would that would affect the um the, the plants that you're trying to grow. Uh, it's interesting because the, the actual silty area that we've planted on, if you dig down, there's a horrible black layer in there. It's quite anaerobic in that. But once these, uh, well, especially the carexes, once they get going, they can get through it, no problems. So, uh, But a lot of the plant, well, Cladium does it, they've got air filled tissue underwater which does cause problems when your plants are too big and you're trying to plant them because they'll float up again um so they they're taking air down all the time um so it's, it's quite interesting whole new learning experience for us <laughs> yeah i was i was going to ask is is there some sort of resource in, in finding out how to how to grow all these native plants or is it literally just a, a trial and error thing that we just have to um we do quite a lot of research online and then after that it's trial and error 
And the idea is that we'll, we can produce almost like a sort of cooking recipe so that you wouldn't need to know a great deal about plants. But once we found out what the knack is with a particular plant, we're putting all this information on the website for other people to use because there's no point in reinventing the wheel. If somebody spent three or four months figuring out how to do something, then the next person doesn't have to waste that time. They can get on and do it straight away. Excellent. Yeah, no, I, I struggle. Well, I, I like to try and propagate some native things. And last year I had a bit of a struggle trying to propagate Sorbus tormenalis, the um the service tree. Mm. And um I think what happened is I'd I had collected the fruit and I'd left it in the Tupperware box and I just I, I'd left it in the Tupperware box for just a bit too long and it, it's slightly fermented in the box. <laughs> so like when I when I opened up the lid, I was hit with a very nice kind of boozy smell. Um, but then when it actually came to the seed viability, I, I don't think it was it was very good because I just left it in that fermenting box for just too long. Um, I got one or two plants out of it, but nothing nothing major. Well, that that's the other thing to mention is that you need uh, a lot of patience for some of these wild plants, and don't don't throw your seed trays away mm. for about two years. Um, so I think we've sort of come to the end of the of the questions. Um, so unless anyone else in the audience just wants to very quickly put anything else in the in the Q and A box. Oh wait, no, I've missed one here. Sorry. Um, so I've got a question here from Rosalind Thompson. Um, so firstly, Martin mentioned the use of the green hay strategy, uh, but then Laurie said it hadn't worked. Was that a general failure or just in some locations? So, I mean, green hay can work very well for, for grasslands, for, for meadow type communities, um, but it doesn't work. It doesn't seem to work very well for, you know, for, for fen, as we as we discussed. So for the wetter type of habitats, um, it doesn't seem to be, I mean, you know, not that it's, it's pointless, but, you know, we haven't had great results from from either spreading cuttings or spreading hand collected seed directly onto prepared seed beds. Um, so do you have any ideas why the green hay fails in, in some some instances or well I mean, as I said before, I think it's because the, the fen species have more um a, a less um you know, evolved to reproduce from seed. Yeah, okay, yeah. They, they've got less, less, less capacity. Yeah. 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 Um, so so that they're, they're less ready germinators. Or they just have infernally complicated. I mean, you know, <laughs> how on earth? I mean, I, I, if you look at the literature, I don't know that anyone's actually found, a, observed a cladium seedling in the wild. And you can understand why. Um, you know, it's easy to do in a nursery setting once you've cracked it, but you think, how on earth are these conditions actually going to, you know, occur in the in the wild? So some of these species have, a, you know, that the, the the seed production is is just an insurance strategy. It's not their main means of, of recruitment. So the second question from uh, Rosalind is: uh, You mentioned supplying fen plants to Kent Wildlife Trust and uh, another trust. So are you starting off with plant material genetically local to Kent or is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That plant? Okay. They're, they're providing us with the seed um, uh, and um, yeah, we're, we're, we're just, just growing it for them because we've got the, the, the space and, the, you know, a little bit of, of know-how. Yeah, no, we're, I mean, we're, we're all about local provenance. We wouldn't encourage moving plants from one end of the, the country to the other. We're very much the opposite of that. Mm. That's brilliant. So I think with that, we will uh, start to bring the bring the session to an end. 